So good afternoon, everybody. Now, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about exploration, but from an exceptional perspective, which is the nanoscale uh, perspective. So the prefix nano is the Greek word for dwarf, and it's used to refer to something that is really, really uh, small. So for instance, when we talk about nano sizes, we use the term nanometer, which refers to, uh, which um, is one billionth of a meter. So 10 to the power of minus nine meters, something really, really uh, small. So imagine, for instance, that you have a one meter ruler. You take this ruler and then you cut into a thousand pieces, this ruler. You have one millimeter. Everyone is familiar with this, uh, with this uh, unit. Then we get this one millimeter and then we cut it again into a thousand pieces. Then we have one micrometer. And then this one micrometer, again, cutting. If we will be able to cut it with the scissors in a thousand pieces, then we will reach a nanometer. But to put the nano scale in a more understandable perspective, you, have to think, you can think, for instance, of a water molecule. A water molecule has a size of 0 0.3 nanometers. So this molecule is as big, about as big, in comparison to a tennis ball, as the tennis ball is to planet Earth. And if we have a look into this regime of really a small objects, actually we can set there many uh, entities that you are all familiar with. So for instance, at the very end, we have atoms or molecules at the smaller sizes. If we move forward, we find DNA strands, then a uh, sizes of about 100 nanometer corresponds to the coronavirus size. Um, if we enter the micrometer regime, uh, we, uh, this is the typical size for bacteria that we have seen already in some of the other presentations today. And then going further, we reach the size, the diameter of one of your hairs, which corresponds to 100 microns. And I this uh, limit is really important of 100 microns because, because it limits the, uh, the sizes that you can see with your naked eyes to the sizes that you cannot see. And to be able to explore this regime uh, below 100 nano, uh, micrometers, we need to use some tools that help us to do that. And the exploration of the nano and the micro world became feasible due to the advancement in the development of instruments that allowed us to see these objects that we were not able to see uh, before. So one of the most important inventions was the invention of the uh, electron microscope. So an electron microscope is uh, just a normal microscope that uses electrons instead of light that you usually uh, use in an optical microscope. And you use electrons because they allow you to see things that you cannot resolve with your naked eye or with an optical microscope. And then you can imagine uh, you are a material scientist and suddenly you are given this uh, new tool to play around. So what do you do? You uh, start uh, exploring everything that is uh, around uh, you. And one of the most um, attractive kind of materials are the biological uh, materials. So these materials uh, are really uh, interesting because they have, because their uh, structural functionality and also because they are organized at different length scales. And for instance, you can see here, it, this is an electron microscopy image. Uh, there in the corner, you can see the scale bar, two microns, pretty small. And this is the outer path of a mouse tooth. This is so-called enamel. And this material, has three uh, levels of uh, organization at different length scales. So we can see these nanofibers here. These nanofibers are made of a material, a crystalline material called hydroxyapatite, one compound. These nanofibers are embedded in a, within a protein matrix. And then they are all bundled together, forming these microfibers that you can see here of about two micro, micrometer size. And then, these fibers also are uh, sharing some of them the same orientation, which is the third level of organization. So all in all, um, the, uh, result, all in all, this result in a material that has incredible properties and that allows you to eat the food every day. 
And this is an interplay between the composition of the material, this crystalline hydroxyapatite, and also of these levels of organization at different length uh, scales. I already mentioned the word crystalline and the word crystal, but what is a crystal? So a crystal is a solid material that uh, is composed of arranged building units that can be atoms, ions, or molecules. So if you go to your kitchen, you can find several crystalline materials. So one, of them, one of them is the cooking salt. So the cooking salt is formed by the regular arrangement of sodium and chloride into a cubic uh, structure. But actually, we don't need to go really far to find crystalline materials because in our own body, we are able to produce many crystalline substances that are um, essential for the proper functioning of our uh, organism. So we are able, as we saw, to chew food, or we are able to stand up straight, or even to keep our balance, thanks to some crystalline materials that we are producing ourselves. But also, crystalline materials are industrially relevant, such as pharmaceutical compounds, or construction uh, materials, such as gypsum uh, and cement. And it's important to uh, study the nanostructure of those materials, but not only the nanostructure, but what yields to this uh, nanostructure. And we can think about the formation of crystalline materials, so called crystallization, as playing with Lego bricks. So imagine that you have uh, at the beginning all the Lego bricks, they are disordered, and they are swimming around in, in a liquid media. Then at the end, you have your Lego structure, which is composed of these Lego bricks that are arranged in order. So the process of crystallization is how do we, is the process from which we go from the disorder swimming uh, bricks to the final order uh, structure. And this process has been understood for more than 100 years within the classical view of crystallization. So um, in brief, this theory, uh, claims that crystallization uh, starts by the Lego bricks colliding with each other. Then eventually you will form a small crystal that is ordered. And then this, when this crystal reach a certain size, is, it will grow by the addition of building units of single Lego building uh, units to form the final uh, macrocrystalline material. But as I said, due to the development of instruments that allowed us to uh, study these processes and this uh, nanostructure, then uh, there were some experimental evidence for many systems that could not be really understood within the classical view of crystallization. This means that there were some uh, stages here involved between the disorder Lego bricks and the final order structure that could not be uh, well explained within this uh, theory. And I will show you one specific case, the case of calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate is the main component, of inorganic component of the uh, eggshell. And it has been shown for the formation of this crystalline material that first you form some assemblies of Lego bricks that they are still swimming around in your solution. Then they uh, aggregate and they densify, forming some, let's call it liquid nanodroplets, you can imagine them as regions on your liquid where you have more concentration of Lego bricks. Then from these nanodroplets, we expel the water out and then we form a solid material, but this solid material is still disordered, so there is no order within the Lego bricks. And then from this disordered material, a uh, order Lego structure emerge, and this structure can grow to give the final macrostructure by adding single Lego bricks, but also larger uh, entities. And uh, I'm a scientist and I work in research of the uh, studying the crystallization uh, mechanism of many different crystalline materials. Some of them are industrially relevant, but others are biologically relevant. And I'm especially uh, interested, interested in um, studying what happened when we add foreign Lego bricks to the media. So when we add some additives in the media, what happened with these uh, stages in this uh, formation process? And why do we care about that? Why do we care about this knowledge at all? Or why do I care about that, uh, this knowledge at all? This fundamental knowledge that I gather, so for instance, for the calcium carbonate system, this is a system I have been studying for many years. And then what I do is to apply this knowledge 
to design some uh, strategies to solve daily problems. So for instance, in this case, we were using calcium carbonate for uh, as a decontaminating agent. So as an, uh, we were putting it into water that wa had a, a high concentration of heavy metals to be able to trap those metals into water and therefore study the feasibility of this compound to be used as a decontaminant. Also, other problems I have to, I work with uh, are actually, I want to avoid the formation of this crystalline material. I want to avoid that the Lego bricks come together and form that crystalline material because these materials can um, provoke problems in industrial processes and also because actually can provoke problems in your own body. So in this case, down, uh, down here in the corner, you can see calcium oxalate crystals. And these crystals are formed, are the main component of kidney stones. So their formation is detrimental for your body. And in that case, we were studying how these crystals are formed and how could we inhibit or uh, delay uh, its, uh, forma their formation. So all in all, it's really important to understand, I hope you got, that it's important to understand the path, the uh, different steps involved in the formation of crystalline uh, materials to be able to come up with means of controlling those uh, processes. And now um, I wanted to introduce you one material that actually doesn't need introduction, which is cement. So I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar with it. But, um, Cement is actually not, so before this talk, probably you all heard about nanotechnology and nanoscience, but I'm pretty sure that when we talk about nanomaterials, cement or concrete are no material that comes to your mind because they are so bulky, they are so um, old, they are known for centuries, and they are so gray and ugly that no one will think about them when we talk about nanomaterials. Uh, so cement is the main component of concrete. So concrete, we make it by simply mixing water with cement and some stones. Then you let this mixture harden, and then it ends up in this uh, material that is fundamental in our society for housing and infrastructure. So as an impressive uh, fact, concrete is the most consumed material after water. But even if this material has been known already for, for centuries, there is still the seek for technological innovation. And this is due to the footprint, uh, to the CO2 footprint associated to the main component of concrete, which is uh, cement. So the production of cement accounts for approximately 8% of the total anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So this is a really huge number. And therefore, the, uh, we, uh, there is some, um, now some urgent need of developing materials with a lower CO2 uh, footprint. And if we look at uh, cement at the nanoscale, it looks like this. So cement is the nanoglue that is keeping together all of the rest of the components. So here we have the unreacted grain, and then from the surface of them, we have this uh, hydrated cement, so this, uh, this other network that they meet with each other, keeping together all the rest of the uh, components. And it has been shown in the, last, uh, in the last years that these disordered networks, they are, uh, we can distinguish some subunits, so some mini bricks there that have those dimensions, but they are disordered and they are not arranged in another way. And also the role that they play on the, uh, the role that they play on the formation of the networks, or even though this, even if these networks are um, an aggregation based, based process, is elusive for scientists. And the important, the important thing to understand here is that the binding ability of cement based material emerged from the nanostructure. So therefore, if we are able to create an unstructure uh, that is beneficial for us, this will result in superior mechanical uh, properties. And in this sense of materials with superior mechanical properties, of course, nature has done already some uh, incredible achievements. So you can see here nacre. So nacre is composed 95% of calcium carbonate, 5% of some protein and organics. 
and is five times tougher than the crystalline material that is 100% calcium carbonate. And why is this? Why are those uh, mechan uh, superior mechanical properties uh, emerging? The, uh, the answer of that, uh, we can find it if we look at the nanostructure. So we have a brick and mortar structure where we have some calcium carbonate platelets that they uh, are arranged uh, in this brick and mortar structure. And this calcium carbonate gives, um, uh, it's a hard but brittle material. So it gives a strength to the uh, to nature. But then also we have this organic membrane that is the responsible for the flexibility and also it inhibits crack uh, propagation, all in all resulting in these uh, amazing mechanical properties. So the same concept could be applied to cement. So we have these platelets that they have been identified. So if we are able to order them in a specific way, then we, can, uh, we could achieve superior mechanical properties. If we achieve superior mechanical properties, this translates into less cement needed for having the same mechanical performance. And this will translate in lower the CO2 emission associated to cement-based uh, materials. But as you can imagine, uh, this is a really ambitious goal and a lot of research needs to be done in order to identify all of these little uh, steps involved in the crystallization process of cement if we want to come up with means of controlling this uh, process. So what I wanted to show you today is that ordinary materials such as cement or nacre, when we look at them at the nanoscale, they are uh, actually quite um, amazing. And in this uh, sense, the, the nano world is, as you saw, upon us. It cannot be questioned or denied, and also its exploration is really important because it can help us not only to understand the world that is surrounding us, but also to develop new strategies, new advanced materials that can help us to improve our world and to tackle the problems or the current and future problems that we, uh, that we face. Thank you very much. <laughs>